A union, however, by its very nature cannot function unless there is solidarity, especially during a strike or the threat of a strike. My learning curve about SAG had begun as I found out that the union had become completely dysfunctional. A very small percentage of actors had ever made a living as actors, but now even the successful ones, those lucky enough to have carved out a career in commercials, were suddenly in trouble due to the explosion of cable networks, USA, ESPN, etc. Advertisers were making a lot of commercials for cable, and that sounds like a good thing. More work for actors, right? But there is an important caveat in the commercial world. If you appear in a commercial for Pepsi, you can't do one for Coke. That makes total sense. But if your commercial is running on one of the broadcast networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, etc., you are compensated for this exclusivity. You're paid a residual payment every time that commercial runs. For those of you who don't know, only the biggest movie and TV stars make their living from their initial contracts. Everyone else makes the bulk of their living afterward from residual payments generated by reruns. Most actors work so infrequently that without residual payments they would be unable to stay in the business and keep pursuing further work. Residual payments are despised by producers and studios, but they actually work to their benefit. As long as there are residuals, there will always be a pool of talented actors that they can hire waiting in the wings. Without residuals, most actors would completely leave the business, and producers would be forced to find non-professionals out there in other lines of work who may or may not have talent and who might not be willing to quit their day job for a small part here and there. On cable, however, under the contract at the time, the residuals were abysmal you were only paid a maximum of $11.32 per day, during which the cable network could run your commercial an infinite number of times. If you watch cable TV, you know that they run some commercials over and over again at every commercial break, every day for weeks or months. This creates overexposure, and it can doom an actor in commercials. Advertisers don't want to hire actors who are too closely associated with one product. So imagine, you get a commercial on a cable network for Ford, you can't work for any other car company, and Coke doesn't want to hire you because that's the guy from the Ford commercial. I'm tired of seeing him. David, Chuck, Bob, and Paul described how established actors, earning only 11 bucks per day, were losing their health insurance and facing mounting debt, even losing their homes. I began to think about how fortunate I was not to be in their situation. Without much thought at all, I found myself saying, How about me running? Dead silence. They weren't expecting that since Bonnie had already told Kathleen that I would say double hell no. I don't know if I'd be able to win, I added. You'd win in a second, Chuck said. Now remember, I had been in the army, and the first thing you learn there is to never volunteer for anything. But here I was, blithely volunteering to step into the great unknown. Up to this point I'd only been in the SAG Hollywood offices once, years ago, to attend the memorial of a departed friend. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. As Bill Daniels, I could speak my mind. As president, I realized that I had to be careful with what I said. I hadn't seen Kirk Douglas for many years, but I was certainly happy to see him when he reached out after my election and asked to speak at the SAG National Membership Meeting. He got up and made a tremendous speech in front of hundreds of members about the importance of our union and the uniqueness of our union. Nowhere else could you find a membership where there was such a large disparity of income. And it was the responsibility of the highest earners, he said, to take care of those at the bottom who needed it most. Unfortunately, our employers would see things differently. Before we even began the commercials contract negotiations, the commercial employers, represented by the Joint Policy Committee, JPC, sent SAG a letter stating that Class A residuals had to come to an end. Class A residuals are the ones paid on network TV and are the lifeblood of every commercial actor. Remember that this was before negotiations had even begun. Was it just a warning shot? No, it wasn't, as it turns out. They meant business. As negotiations got underway and we tried to get an increase in cable residuals, they kept insisting on doing away with the formula for Class A. If we had agreed to this, it would have been the same as taking money out of one of your pockets and putting it into another. A lot of pain and no gain. The JPC would not budge and so the board of directors unanimously voted to strike. Unfortunately for actors, anything worth fighting for has only been won through a strike. That's a historical fact. 1956, 1960, 1978, 1980, 1987, 1988. Without those strikes, there would be no residuals paid for anything. There would be no pension and health plan. Sometimes just the threat of a strike has been enough to gain a fair contract, but not this time. The JPC was determined to force us into an unconditional surrender. 
The commercial strike of 2000 lasted for six months and was the longest strike in the history of the Union. We had high-profile actors such as Susan Sarandon, Treat Williams, Richard Dreyfus, Julia Roberts, and Rosie O'Donnell there, who all spoke with passion about the unfairness of the commercial's contract when it came to the average actor. They were heroes during all of this. They had nothing to win and everything to lose. They ran the risk of advertisers in the future potentially refusing to hire them for multi-million dollar commercial campaigns. The executives at SAG were actually against the inclusion of famous people. They felt it reduced public sympathy for the cause by creating the impression that millionaires, not struggling working people, were on strike. I ignored the staff, and I brought in many stars such as Elliot Gould, who worked diligently to bring in many other celebrity actors to help our cause. And then, of course, there was Kevin Spacey, who turned out to be a great asset, literally. Kevin led the way, and soon Helen Hunt, Harrison Ford, Nicolas Cage, and others donated millions of dollars to striking actors through the SAG Foundation to help pay bills and buy groceries. It appears now that lawyers and ad agencies were really the driving force behind the JPC's intransigence, and the advertisers themselves, like Mr. Pepper, didn't really understand what it was all about. The day after the strike ended, Richard Mazur appeared on National Public Radio and declared that, in a strike, no one wins. Really? Actors received a 140% raise in cable residuals. To understand the magnitude of this kind of achievement, no union contract negotiated before or since has gotten more than a 3% gain per year. We also gained jurisdiction over commercials in the area of new media. And at the time, what the hell was that? As an explosion of commercials on the Internet was about to begin, we had clearly ensured the future. And we ensured the present and the future by preserving Class A residuals on network TV. The total amount paid to actors in the commercials contract has grown practically every year since, breaking records. In 2014, the total amount paid to commercial actors topped $1 billion. We would never be here without the gains of the 2000 strike. The strike was so successful that when it came time to negotiate the TV theatrical contract, Lou Wasserman, who was the last link to Jack Warner, Louis B. Mayer, and the other moguls from the golden age of Hollywood, asked me to come to his office at Universal Studios. He insisted I call him Lou, and without ever mentioning the commercial strike, he proceeded to give me his sage advice. He said, Bill, I have a studio here with a lot of sound stages that I have to keep busy, and I can't do it without actors to work in them. And, of course, actors need to make a living. So, in fact, we need each other. We are, in fact, partners. Sometimes we don't give the actors enough, and we have to fix that. These things we fix every three years in negotiations, but always bearing in mind that we are partners. Shortly after that, I entered into the TV theatrical negotiations, and, needless to say, they went smoothly. This was truly a blessing, not just for the union, but for me personally. For the TV theatrical negotiations, I insisted that we work closely with the WGA, the Writers Guild, who were about to have their own negotiations with the studios. When we compared our contracts with the WGA contracts, we had a dramatic moment. It took two actors on our committee, David Jolliffe and George Coe, to realize that we had been losing millions of dollars each year due to an oversight. Producers had insisted that our contracts were the same as those of the writers, but George and David discovered that we were, in fact, not receiving the same amount for pension and health benefits. And, no thanks to the highly paid SAG staff, they never noticed even though this had been going on for 15 years. On that triumphant note, my two difficult years were over. And here is where the story takes its darkest turn. Our political opposition in the Union began a campaign of attacking, no, vilifying, anyone who had been associated with the strike. Even though New York actors had unanimously voted for the strike and actively participated in it, they were now saying that the whole thing was a mistake and began mercilessly launching ad hominem attacks via email. They unfairly named actors in these emails who had done nothing but give up their personal and professional lives to make the strike a success. Though New York was making me out to be the chief villain, and so odd considering the fact that I still considered myself a New York actor, honestly, I was able to take it but I felt horrible for the strike captains and other actor organizers who were now unfairly depicted as fools and idiots. It was important for our political enemies to paint the strike as a failure. If they gave us any credit, how could they possibly win the next election? And they were so successful in their strategy that they were able to win back the next presidency, with Melissa Gilbert defeating the immensely talented and qualified Valerie Harper, who lost, no doubt, because she was one of our biggest supporters. 
Melissa had run her campaign against Valerie by attacking what we had done over the last two years, promising that there would be no further strikes on her watch. Another player who entered the picture also made sure that there would be no job action. The new NED, who we knew was a former studio executive, but who was also, unbeknownst to us at the time, a board member at Netflix, as well as a large stockholder. At worst, the fox appeared to be in the hen house. At best, this was clearly a conflict of interest. This man, by the way, would later go on to head up the Motion Picture Association of America, MPAA, the chief lobbying group for the major studios. By continually declaring that the commercial strike was a failure and convincing the membership of this false premise, they have virtually ensured that the membership will never again approve a strike, and without that our union, any union, has no power whatsoever. They effectively undermined every negotiation ever since. As a result, actors today are receiving residual checks that are, in some cases, literally for one cent. I'm not kidding. One cent. Shamefully, actors have only gotten a tiny increase in residuals over the past 15 years on made-for-cable TV shows, a billion-dollar industry. The Internet is essentially a residual-free zone except for high-budget scripted shows, where even there the residuals formula is unlivable. It's now almost impossible for the average working actor to make a living except in commercials. Go figure.